All right, looks like we're recording. Everything seems to be uh, going well, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I see a couple people that look like they might be new to the course, so uh, I'll go ahead and make an introduction to uh, the course and uh, the idea behind it. Uh, this is Digital Marketing, which is DMK201 from Piccolo International University. Uh, my name is Ryan Bush. Uh, a little bit about these, uh, these lectures. This is a unique format. Um, what we're doing is we're uh, combining uh, the four credit opportunity for students at Piccolo International University uh, with uh, the opportunity to bring in uh, people and, uh, from the Edufire community into the same course. And uh, uh, we'll all join together in the study of uh, digital marketing for this course. Uh, we're on our fifth lecture of eight, so we've got a couple more to go. And uh, uh, this week, uh, we're going to be uh, talking uh, about uh, two, different, uh, two different topics. Um, really, the first we're going to start with is uh, the lecture we missed last, last week, which is lecture four uh, of the series. And uh, we're going to be talking about formulating uh, market and product strategies. And we're going to be talking about the online value proposition. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, also, also should let you uh, uh, know that uh, this may run over the hour because of these combined topics. So um, if you can't stay for the whole lecture for one reason or another, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we are recording it right now. So uh, you will have a link to uh, view this recording when we're done. Uh, so there shouldn't be any concerns with, uh, uh, with being able to pick it up and, and review it at a later time if you have to miss some of this. Um, we don't. I don't expect this is going to go to two hours. Uh, we'll probably run maybe 15 minutes over uh, over our hour our normal hour limit. So uh, let's get started, and uh, we'll pick up where we missed last week. Um, we want to talk about uh, uh, key decision making uh, for uh, for for the uh, concepts here of uh, um, formulating market and product strategies. Um, this decision making process is really a framework. Um, that we're going to uh, view these strategies from. And uh, the first set of questions uh, that we look at um, deal with delivering value. So these are, these are uh, related to how we're, uh, uh, what we're selling and, and to whom we're selling it. Um, those would be the market and product strategies. Uh, selling what and how being business and revenue strategies. Uh, target market marketing strategy, uh, which is what is sold where and uh, positioning and differentiation, uh, which is uh, when, when something is offered uh, and bought. So um, we will go ahead and uh, move into some uh, very clear uh, uh, market and product strategies uh, to discuss, uh, uh, to discuss the, uh, the idea of key decision making uh, uh, from, that, from that perspective. Market and product strategies, like I said, um, we're dealing with who we sell to when we're talking about the market. So the market, the market being the audience uh, that we're, we're uh, looking to sell uh, our product or service to. Uh, and the product itself, uh, product is really a, a product or service in this case, and uh, it's what we sell. And uh, what, what we want to picture here is when we're considering the market and product strategies, we're going to be looking at, uh, hold on one second for me, when we're talking about market and product development strategies, we can consider this in, in a matrix. Uh, this is a, a quadrant setup. Uh, let me go ahead and get my pointer ready here. Um, we talked about the idea of these these four quadrant matrices uh, when we when we spoke about our, our SWOT analysis uh, in in our lecture number three and um, what we have here is uh, different variations uh, different variations of um, strategy dealing with either growth of the market or growth of the product so you can see that uh, in the axis axis here. Um, we're looking at market growth, so meaning uh, that uh, market growth being, are we going to uh, be working with uh, the same audience that we've sold to in the past? Are we going to grow, uh, grow into a new audience? Uh, let me go ahead and take a, a quick note at the uh, questions here. Uh, so, okay, uh, Camilla, you're asking what a swap. I'm sorry, it's actually SWOT, and that's S-W-O-T. I'll go ahead and type that in there so you can see that. 
Um, Peter is uh, going, giving us a good uh, a def or definition of that. SWAT is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And in that analysis, uh, that was discussing situational analysis. Um, and that means that we're taking a look at the, uh, the picture of the organization before we do our, our um, strategizing. And we're, we're defining things as to what are the organization's strengths, what are their weaknesses, what opportunities do they have, and what threats do they have. And if you remember from that lecture, uh, we then talked about how we can pair uh, the different strengths, weaknesses, threats, and opportunities into, into different strategic op options. Um, so in that in that in the SWOT analysis, which is laid out uh, very similar to our, our matrix uh, here uh, that you're seeing on screen right now, um, you would have you have four different quadrants, and um, we're going to look at how each of these uh, uh, compare against the others, and uh, understanding how pairing these things together or moving from one uh, one quadrant to another quadrant changes different strategic options. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. Um, let's go ahead and, and, and we'll go through the, the, the market and product development matrix and we're going to go ahead and define um, uh, both product growth and market growth and then talk about each of the quadrants. So uh, before we started talking about the SWOT analysis, we were talking about market growth. Um, Market penetration is at the low end of, of the market growth uh, axis, meaning that um, penetration uh, for a market is moving deeper into a market, um, uh, is, is moving deeper into a market that you're already working with. As you go up, as you go up the axis, you're going to go into market development. Um, that's, that's uh, moving further away from your current markets and moving into new market opportunities. So you can see that, you can see that um, in this, in this uh, section, you, be, you start yeah, with people you're already selling to, and you're moving to people that, that you might want to sell to. Likewise with product growth, um, the, the left side of the matrix um, represents uh, product growth uh, that is in a uh, um, pro product growth, uh, uh, meaning that you're going to be working with current products and and uh, uh, into developing new products. So you, you've got what you already have established, and moving into things that are new opportunities. So you can see at each of the far ends of the of the axis axes, um, you're moving into areas of, of new development. Um, things that you haven't worked on before as part of your strategic work. Um, and as you get closer together into the, the beginning of the, of the uh, axes, uh, you're dealing with things that you already have in play and figuring out how to better optimize those. Does that make sense when you're looking at the, when you're looking at the uh, uh, matrix here? Okay, great. Let's talk about the quadrants then. Um, the first one we'll talk about is, is penetration. Market penetration, uh, as I mentioned, is used to sell more existing products into existing markets. So this is an effort to improve efficiency of what you're doing. Uh, you take what you have already, uh, both as a product and a market, and, and, you, and you seek to uh, deepen the relationship. In this quadrant here, market development. Um, market development is used to sell existing products into new markets. So with, with that in mind, um, let me ask everybody, um, can, can anyone give me an example of a market, uh, a market penetration strategy? That's, that's a strategy that you might have seen where, where a company tries to sell more existing products to existing markets, and you can raise your hand, and we can we can bring you on the microphone, uh, or you can feel free to type your your thoughts into the chat the chat column. Okay. 
Peter, any any thoughts on market penetration? How it might be? Uh, how how uh, you may have seen companies in the world use uh, trying to sell existing products to existing markets that they already have. Let me use maybe a, a, an example of a product that a lot of people don't really um, like, uh, but it's, it, oh, well, let's see, uh, the iPod. Okay, let's use that one for example. Um, Ariane, when you, when you mention the iPod, give me an example of how the iPod would be selling more iPods into existing iPod markets. So, you, you mentioned video. That's a that's a good example, I think, actually, um, of, of of product development. Uh, the idea that the, the iPod originally was a was a music player, um, and as they are as they are developing that product, uh, they they've reached an audience uh, that that all has music players of some sort already. Um, so, by adding a video component to the iPod. Uh, we might look at that as, as a, uh, a product development opportunity. You see how uh, you see how that could be. Can, yeah, there you go. So you can see how that could be uh, an example of uh, taking uh, um, an existing market, people who use iPods. See, we're down at the we're down at the low end uh, of the market growth strategy. So existing market and developing the product. Uh, that can be sold into that existing market. So that's a good that's a good example of the of the product development quadrant. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, anyone any other thoughts on on the market penetration quadrant? I think the example that I was going to offer um, is is the tobacco industry. Uh, they uh, they are, uh, have a very long history of of selling more uh, of existing products into existing markets. Um, there's a number of uh, uh, regulations, government regulations, that prevent them from. Uh, 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 formally trying to access uh, new markets within within the U.S., for example, uh, but they they do a lot of things to try to develop their product uh, reach into existing markets. Uh, with that, uh, not a not a particularly well liked uh, industry, but a, a good example, I think, of, of market penetration. Um, let's think about market development here for a moment. Um, Market development again. We're we're trying to sell existing products into new markets. Um, Ariana, you you had mentioned um, uh, you had mentioned the iPod. Uh, let's let's consider the iPod for 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 this example as well. Um, what might be an example of the iPod selling an existing product into into a new market? And the question is open for everyone. Downloading downloading audiobooks. Um, again, I think I think that's a great I think that's a great example. Um, to me, that actually. Um, that actually might fall into the diversification category uh, a little bit. Um, let's hold that thought for a moment, so we can, when we move into diversification, we can consider it. So, um, uh, Peter, you, you mentioned iTunes. Um, that's a, I think that's a good example uh, of some things that we're going to be talking about here. Uh, how would you, Peter? How would you suggest uh, iTunes are a market development strategy? Steve, iPhone apps. Actually, I think that's a. Uh, I think that's a good. 
uh, I think that's a good uh, a good example of that. Uh, let me let me explain why I think the the, the iPhone apps might be uh, more applicable to the market development strategy. Uh, to repeat it again, market development is selling existing products into new markets. Um, so with that in mind, if we have iPhone apps uh, as an example um, of an existing product, uh, the variety of those products available in iPhone apps may open new market opportunities for, for people who aren't currently using an iPhone. Uh, so you, you may uh, initially get a market that is uh, uh, filled with technology enthusiasts who just want the iPhone. Um, but then you've got different different markets out there, business people, um, uh, students, uh, people of all sorts that have different needs for their technology devices. Uh, so by, by calling the iPhone App Store uh, a, a single product, uh, I think we can see that that's a product that uh, expresses itself into many new markets. Uh, does, that, does that one make sense for everybody? Steve, I think that's a great example. One of one of the one one of the very clear examples I think we can consider as well uh, when we talk about uh, um, market development is the idea of, of international business uh, globalization in, in marketing efforts. So if you look at the U.S. as a market in, in itself, uh, an existing product line sold in the U.S. Uh, could be looking at a market development strategy uh, when they when they begin to look for uh, new opportunities in other countries. Um, Probably uh, one of the most clear examples of, of a market development strategy is, is the globalization effort. Um, let's talk about a, a little bit more uh, about the product development uh, uh, arena. We've, we've mentioned several areas here um, that really do fall into, into product development. We've talked about um, iPods going from music to music and video. Um, great example uh, of that. Um, Ariana, you mentioned downloading audiobooks. I think that that is also, that part of that, just the audiobook concept itself is certainly part of a product uh, development strategy uh, to enhance, enhance a product uh, in a way that, that allows you to sell new products into existing markets. Um, it, App, Apple is, is now going into a new realm. Um, many of you may have heard of this, um, the idea of the, the Apple tablet. Um, it's somewhere uh, a cross between a, a Kindle or a Sony book reader uh, and an iPhone. Uh, have, have you all heard of that idea? The, the idea behind that I think is an excellent example um, of, of diversification. Diversification strategies are selling new products into new markets. Certainly, uh, the, the Apple tablet, whenever it does come out, is going to be an opportunity um, for, for Apple to sell to an existing market with a new product. Uh, but it, 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 it's an opportunity for them to reach even further. So people who don't necessarily have or want an iPhone um, are going to be new opportunities for them. People who are looking for, for the book reading capacities and maybe some enhancements that you might not find with a Kindle or, or a Sony Reader um, um, uh, device. Uh, so I think that um, these, these are some great examples you've all given uh, of, of showing these different uh, 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 strategies that, that filter into uh, the, the matrix here. And um, each of these, uh, I think what we can clearly say is that there's not necessarily a, a clear line defining these. You can, we have this nice matrix here um, that's really built into, into nice, neat little cells um, that, that qualify into different types of strategies. Uh, but in the end, as you get into practical situations, there are many crossover areas. You know, you, you can start to see that the App Store concept uh, might be falling into diversification areas or product development areas. And there may be moments when uh, the marketing strategy behind it is one that moves from one quadrant to the next. So we don't want to look at this quadrant as, as a rigid idea, uh, but simply a tool that we can use uh, when we're considering uh, the types of planning uh, that we have available for us when we're developing the lifestyle of, uh, the, the life cycle uh, of a marketing of a marketing strategy. So uh, 
let me ask you, are there any questions about these, these four different quadrants relating to market growth and product growth? Okay, great. We'll move on right now to talking about the online value proposition. Uh, when we're when we're talking about the strategies related uh, in the in the matrix, there, uh, one thing that we need to be considering uh, throughout the process is uh, the the value proposition we have when we're talking about uh, the the online component of, of our marketing strategy. Um, I say this in particular uh, because remember we've talked throughout our lectures about the fact that that online or digital marketing. Is, is a channel that's part of a larger uh, marketing multi-channel approach. Uh, so uh, the online value proposition is, is something of a offshoot of, of, the, of the, the unique value proposition for, for a product. And this in particular, we want to consider it from uh, the digital perspectives. What, what do people understand about the product's uniqueness and, and it's and it's value to them uh, in in formats that are that are being done in the digital channel. So we could say that the online value proposition is a concept that that strengthens core value of a product and differentiates the online offering from both offline business for the company and competitive offerings. So this is this is an area where we're we're actually saying, in a digital world, where we're selling a product, how can we differentiate what is being sold between our online business and our and our offline business? Consider it maybe uh, from a, a retail store's location, uh, you know, maybe a mall uh, versus a a retail store's website. This may be may be a good example for for differentiating um, the value proposition uh, for the online group versus the 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 in store group. Uh, does anybody have an example of an experience that they they may have had with with some sort of retailer working with both an a, a website? versus the, the an in-store experience. Uh, I, maybe as a quick example of this question, uh, you can go to a Gap store to buy clothing. Uh, you can find them all over the place. Uh, but you can also buy from Gap online. So if I were to consider the online value proposition, how might the online value proposition be different from the, the on-ground or in-store value proposition for a customer? What part? What parts of the experience differentiate the experience? Delivery. Uh, that I think that's a great. That's a great example. Delivery uh, certainly uh, uh, can differentiate the experience. When you are dealing with a, an in-store offering, delivery is not really a value feature that you're you're dealing with. Delivery is a function. Um, of the uh, of the transportation system the store uses to move clothing from a warehouse to uh, a retail store uh, versus um, the the online experience where delivery is a factor as part of the sale so how much you charge me for delivery how fast you you attempt to deliver the product these are these are good examples so um, Consider the company Zappos. Uh, many of you have probably heard of Zappos, which is an on uh, online uh, apparel retailer. They were originally a shoe company. Uh, they are consistently noted at, at the top of the industry for their level of customer service. Uh, one of the things that, that they will do is uh, you have a year to make a return with them, and uh, that delivery can be free. Uh, it can be expedited for, for low cost. In fact, they recently uh, released a program called VIP, which uh, allows certain buyers who buy from Zappos regularly to shop through a VIP website that allows you to have overnight shipping for free. 
So in that case, the online value proposition for Zappos is something that um, gives, you, gives you that opportunity to consider delivery as a major factor in your decision-making process, something that, that may have been an impediment to, to uh, comparing a, an in-store offering. If I were to go to the Gap in person at, at a store location, I don't have to worry about delivery costs. Uh, but if I want to buy a product, uh, a product online, I might have to consider that in there. But Zappos is able to create an online value proposition which says uh, delivery is free. Um, I noticed that, uh, Steve, you, you mentioned price. Um, give, can you give me an example of what you're thinking about when you, when you mentioned price, Steve? So how would price be an online value proposition uh, that differentiates or strengthens core value? <laughs> when, when you pay less for something, you like it more. Um, which impact your experience? A absolutely. Certainly prices, you know, that's a great, that's going to be a great lead into our next lecture as well. My question would be, uh, it, when you mention price uh, and paying less for something, um, it is, is online a place where you're going to uh, automatically assume that you pay less for something and you would in store. How would how might you consider how might you position? You're you're in a position to to differentiate uh, your online value from from your offline business or your competition's offering over prices. Is is, is how would you make that strategy uh, visibly available to people who are who are going to buy from you? I mean, I could certainly walk into a Walmart and, and get a low price in their store. How would, how would price online uh, potentially be, be part of my value proposition? Agre agreed. Uh, that, that, you know, it's not always true that, that that online um, equals a lower price. I think that price does have a factor uh, in, the, in the proposition when you consider uh, the various costs that go into creating your final price. Uh, again, we go back to that, that shipping example. Uh, if I remove shipping costs from my, my final price on a purchase, uh, that's, a, that's a value proposition that can be differentiating uh, online. Um, I think also that when we consider uh, price comparisons, and we'll be talking about that in a little bit, but we consider price comparisons as part of um, a shopping experience for people, price can be a differentiating factor. Um, but there is a, an element that, that, that does not uh, necessarily have a logical relationship uh, when it comes to uh, price as a choice, but certainly I think those are examples
Everyone's still with me there? I have a little, little freeze up there. Looks like uh, I can hear my voice is being invisible again here. All right, I'm going to go ahead and keep going. Everything looks like we're still recording properly. Um, okay, we're talking about uh, the, the marketing mix decisions. Um, Multi-channel distribution is, is a decision we need to make in, in context of uh, conveying uh, the value to the customer. multi-channel communications, how we're going to um, uh, communicate and what Can everyone see me again?
Hi everyone. Um, I, I really apologize for the uh, the the issues here. I have no idea why uh, the screens keep uh, blanking on and off. Uh, it's happening for me as well. Uh, so <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate that uh, you're you're sticking with me. Uh, I'm just going to continue to try to push forward, uh, and if it uh, if it stops again, if this keeps occurring, uh, I'll just keep picking things right back up. So. Uh, oh, so uh, uh, it looks like a, a, an astrology comment about Mercury being in retrograde. That very well could be the case. Absolutely. Um, our final our final element of the marketing mix is uh, the um, uh, organizational capabilities, and we define this uh, as seven S's. And I was mentioning before we were interrupted that uh, there are some similarities uh, to the elements of the seven S's. Uh, as you might find in the balanced scorecard. So if you go back to, I believe it's lecture three, and uh, uh, consider the balanced scorecard elements, you'll you'll understand that uh, this uh, s this large this large variety of of organizational elements uh, all factor into the the decision making process. The S's are uh, strategy, structure, systems, staff, style skills and superordinate goals so really uh, the overall goals for the organization um, the uh, the seven the seven S's uh, are, are an important consideration to make when we're working out our mix because we have to really understand uh, what are the strategic parts of, of our decision process what strategies do we go for using our, our matrix uh, approach um, does this fit within the organization strategy uh, the structure uh, of our organization. How does that uh, factor into um, our mix? Uh, if we've got a, a good a good variety of very skilled uh, online digital marketers, uh, might we uh, find ourselves balanced towards uh, the online communications channels versus offline communications channels? Uh, likewise, systems that we have available. Um, technology has been a challenge for us in the, in this course today. So we want to make sure that we've got uh, technological capabilities able to support the mix that we're uh, ready to offer. Uh, staff, uh, as mentioned before, we want to make sure we've got the, uh, the, the right staff in place to structure things properly. Um, the style of the organization. In our mix, are we properly, uh, are, we, are we actually uh, using you know, the natural style of the organization and the people involved in that organization uh, as part of our of our marketing mix, are we fighting against those for some reason? Uh, happens uh, more often than you might think uh, that organizations try to uh, not be themselves, so to speak. Um, skills uh, really falls uh, into the staff area a little bit there, but uh, um, let's take that into a, a larger uh, frame of reference and, and understand it from the perspective of the organization's skill sets. Uh, is the organization prepared in in one way or another to compete uh, with their with their offering um, in in the mix that they're planning? Uh, do they know what they're doing? You might, if you're a small local restaurant, for example, uh, trying to uh, uh, have a skilled uh, competition against McDonald's, for example, uh, might not be the best mix strategy to consider. Uh, and superordinate goals it is the marketing mix. For the products that we're talking about, aligned with the overall goals for the organization. So I hope that makes sense for everybody. Um, again, you know, a, a good reference for this is um, uh, the 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 book for the course that we're working with. Um, there's some very very detailed descriptions of, of these uh, areas in there. And since we're having uh, uh, such a, a technological challenge in the, in this particular lecture right now. I highly recommend uh, making sure that you have a copy of that book so that you can follow along with these lectures in relationship to that book. So, um, with that, uh, with that said, I'm going to move on to um, our lecture for this week. Uh, this is talking about the four P's of marketing in the digital realm. So we just talked about the seven S's, and we're going to talk about the four P's. Uh, it's it's a it's a day for acronyms. Um, Let's go ahead and uh, talk about, the, we're talking about the applications of the marketing mix, strategies for development and measurement, 
and smart product and pricing strategies. For those of you who are asking about the SWOT acronym, um, I should clarify SMART as well. SMART is a goal setting uh, a formula and SMART stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and, and time related. Uh, so when you are setting goals, you want to make sure that you hit each of those SMART points, specific, measurable, Achievable, relevant, time-related. Uh, go back to lecture three if you have a, if you have any thoughts about that. Uh, the notes are available through Edufire as well. Um, let's move forward and start talking about the four P's. Uh, these are uh, the four P's are, are are the primary marketing variables that uh, you're going to be dealing with. Uh, those P's are product, price, place, and promotion. And uh, those of you who do get the book for the course and are following along with that, uh, the, the authors of the book also suggest that there are three additional P's. Uh, and they note that there's some controversy whether those three additional P's uh, are separate or not. I, I personally find uh, that those, those three additional P's really do factor into our, our four here. So I'd like to focus really on these four. Uh, they're still very relevant uh, to, to marketing in, in the digital world as well as the, uh, the, as well as the time that they were uh, developed. Uh, the four pieces of marketing were developed back in the 1960s and it's important to understand that because uh, these concepts were originally developed and, and, uh, and considered in a time period that uh, was a push marketing uh, paradigm, meaning that uh, you were you were seeking actively to push a message in front of a person to to, uh, to get that message out there. The advertising format, where where you are communicating a message, uh, whether somebody wants to hear it or not. Um, that's important to understand because in in creating these concepts, we want to reimagine them in the digital realm. And uh, in the digital realm, if you if you remember back to lecture one, we talked that digital. Uh, has a lot to do about moving from a push strategy into a pull strategy. So uh, with our four P's, uh, product, price, place, promotion, product is really what is sold. You could call that services as well. That's particularly different now uh, in, the, in the digital uh, area of marketing. Um, price is, is um, uh, what you are uh, actually uh, going to be uh, doing to target value. Uh, places where where it is sold, um, meaning uh, an example meaning those those channels that we talked about uh, from lecture four, the the, the multi-channel uh, uh, places of distribution, and uh, the promotion, which is the actual messaging tactics, the communication tactics. Let's talk about the digital effect on product. Uh, this is probably one of the one of the biggest areas of influence from from the digital world. Um, product has uh, digital marketing and, and digital uh, uh, formats have the ability uh, to change the core product, modify extended products, offer online research, which is uh, a major change from uh, the time period when the four P's were developed, increase the speed of development of products and increase the speed of diffusion of products. So let's, let's start at the top and, and, and talk about changing the core product. Uh, the, the core product uh, is really you know, the very base level of what you're, what you're working with. Uh, the example that I might be able to give you is, is, the, is the software QuickBooks. Uh, originally QuickBooks was a software that you could actually, uh, uh, that you actually purchased in a box uh, called Box Software, and you would install it on your computer, and you would run this program from your computer in isolation from the rest of the world. That's the core product. Um, the idea of, of changing this core product uh, is, is particularly important when you consider it online because you've got the ability to, to take that core product and change it into a format that um, fits the online world. You could still buy QuickBooks and install it on your computer, but now there's an option for, for QuickBooks called QuickBooks Online. 
where I no longer have to install uh, install QuickBooks. I don't have to make a single purchase of it either. I can buy it, I can buy it in installments every month. Um, digital uh, digital effects on the product uh, allow me to also extend the product uh, into new areas in ways that weren't uh, options before. Um, so example for that would be that QuickBooks, the the company that produces QuickBooks offers a service online called Billing Manager. Billing Manager is a free invoicing service that allows you to uh, set up your business on, on uh, online through, and, and invoice people using this free service. This is, an ex this is an extension of that core product. And what's interesting about it is that uh, because of its free format, it, it, puts, it puts the uh, producer of the product in a position to really uh, uh, have regular communications with you about their, their product line. Um, online research is another, um, as I mentioned, major area of, of change from when the original four, uh, original concept of the four P's came out. Um, in the 1960s, when the four P's were really uh, uh, invented or, or put out there uh, as a concept, uh, market research was done primarily through concepts of focus groups, where you would gather groups of uh, people that, that fit your target market uh, demographics, meaning that uh, you were defining who they were as people uh, that you were interested in selling to and asking them for input about your particular product. Uh, online opportunities uh, create round-the-clock opportunities for research. Um, you could certainly do formal research work online um, in structured formats, but consider the concept of chat rooms and uh, feedback and uh, uh, product reviews uh, as an element of market research. Uh, these are unparalleled uh, in, in uh, the selling of products. You're getting the ability to get direct, uh, unsolicited feedback from customers about their honest experience with your product uh, when, you're doing, uh, when you're reading through reviews about what, what people have to say about the product you bought. Um, remarkable. Um, the next step in, in this is uh, the increase in speed for development. It might take years for a product uh, during the time period of the original 4P development uh, to create a, a new product uh, or to modify a product based on research. Uh, we've got an environment now with the, with the internet that allows us to uh, achieve a much more rapid pace in, in this change or development of products. We can learn about what people like and what they don't like faster. We can make modifications uh, more quickly. An example might be the way that Google does um, new product releases. Many of you uh, have probably seen uh, Google release new concepts on a regular basis and they'll release them in a beta format. Uh, many times they'll, they'll make an exclusive invita invitation to people to uh, try the new product. Um, I remember several years back before, before Gmail was uh, so prevalent, uh, getting into the Gmail beta test uh, was uh, um, you know, a, real, a real honor for somebody. It's something that uh, people coveted that opportunity and wanted to get that invitation to try it out. Uh, the idea behind it was that, that uh, Google saying that it wasn't, it wasn't ready for prime time yet, but we want to know what you, what you think about it. We want you to use it. We want you to try breaking it. We want you to tell us how we can improve it. Um, all of those elements uh, mean that uh, they'll get great feedback on it, but it also means that because they release it in that format, they're getting out in front of the market much faster than other people. Speed of diffusion as well. Um, diffusion meaning that how fast the word spreads about your product. Um, that's an amazing difference uh, in the digital uh, arena uh, these days. It, it, going back to the 1960s again, uh, you would have uh, products that were developed in major metropolitan areas released among specific members of the population in, in those areas and it would grow and word would, word would spread internally, but it would stay limited to very specific targeted metropolitan areas uh, and then it would begin to reach out into wider distribution channels. Um, the speed in which products can be diffused online uh, is, is phenomenal. Um, we've all heard uh, the idea of a viral video. Uh, the idea that you can load a video on YouTube and a couple days later have had three, four million people look at it if it's a good, if it's a good video. Um, that's an example of, of that kind of product uh, confusion, um, uh, product diffusion. Uh, specifically, uh, let's talk about uh, this in terms of uh, 
Malcolm Gladwell's concept of the tipping point. Uh, that's a book that you can all uh, find. Uh, it's a great book uh, for marketers to read. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell uh, discusses a couple of key elements uh, of uh, diffusion in this, and that's about how to get the word spread. Um, the first thing that he wants, he wants to, us to think about is uh, that success depends on the initial adopters of your product. So um, who do you get that word out to uh, is important. So if you remember, Google would invite very specific people initially uh, to be part of a beta test. Um, I don't think it's going to be any accident that the people they invite uh, might be uh, those who are going to spread the word or connect it to other people more quickly. That's important. So success depends on initial adopters in diffusion, and you can find very targeted groups of the right adopters uh, if you do your research. Uh, additionally, uh, the stickiness of the product. Um, the stickiness meaning um, how, how relevant is it? Um, how easy is it to use? Uh, you know, how important do people find it to be? Uh, those factors all uh, factor in uh, to whether or not it's going to stay through its diffusion course. Uh, the example might be uh, Friendster versus YouTube. If you all remember back before, um, back before uh, we all had Facebook accounts, uh, the, the, the very early form of this was, uh, uh, was Friendster. Um, and there were certain you know, good, good parts and bad parts uh, to Friendster. Uh, but it got around and it had a lot of people questioning whether or not they wanted to use it as an early social media tool. But if you compare that to YouTube, for example, YouTube, which has only been around since I believe 2005, there's an, ex there's an extreme example of how the diffusion process works. Friendster spread and stopped and died. YouTube spread and spread and spread and continues to spread and grow. And I think a lot of that has to do with the stickiness of the, of the idea. Uh, the way that it was created to uh, allow people to put up anything about anything they were doing, um, that's a real sticky idea. Uh, you were asking about the title and author for, okay, so let me go ahead and quickly answer that question for you. Uh, the, the author's name is uh, Malcolm Gladwell. And the book is The Tipping Point. And uh, frankly, I would recommend uh, other Malcolm Gladwell books as well uh, if you're considering uh, uh, this idea. He's got a couple books out there. They vary on subject matter, but uh, they're, they're all very interesting reads, uh, deal a lot with human behavior, and uh, something that I think most digital marketers should have an understanding of. Uh, I'd also recommend uh, Made to Stick as well. Um, sorry, I can't remember the author's names right now, which is uh, ironic, but uh, just type in uh, Made to Stick in Amazon and uh, check that out. That's a good complement to the tipping point. Um, the next element of diffusion that I want to go over that, that Gladwell introduces uh, is context. Um, how, uh, how a concept is, is, is put out into the world, in what context it's, it's distributed, is important. Uh, Gladwell's example is uh, referencing uh, New York uh, crime rates. There was a period of time when uh, crime was going through the roof in New York. Um, and the solution, which was very interesting uh, for solving the crime problem, was not about having more police officers uh, in force or solving more murders or, or being more present, but it was actually about uh, removing graffiti from subway trains. And the concept being that uh, Crime in context. Uh, if the city looked like it didn't care about what happened in the city, then people felt like the city didn't care, and that gave them the context to, to become more criminal. When the city instituted a campaign to remove graffiti from the train lines, no matter how, how quickly uh, somebody put graffiti on a, on a New York train, there, that train was being stopped and cleaned so that the graffiti was gone. When people started seeing that the, the, the graffiti was no longer there, the, the concept that people no longer uh, uh, cared whether or not crime existed uh, began to change the context in which it happened. Uh, so if we can try to apply that into, into uh, marketing concepts, uh, we want to put out our products in, in a context that matters. Um, and what's important, uh, important example, let's, let's deal with YouTube and QuickBooks, for example. 
uh, YouTube has a mass has a mass appeal to it. Uh, the context is uh, broadcast yourself uh, versus QuickBooks, which has a very specific appeal. So how fast the concept can diffuse depends on the context. If the context text is specific, uh, as in the case with QuickBooks, there's only so so far that it will it will spread. Uh, that doesn't mean that the product will not be successful. But you want to release it within the context uh, that it can it can spread. YouTube, on the other hand, has wider appeal. So making sure that uh, the context in which YouTube spreads is 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 a is a wider audience and, and reaching out in that format. Well, that 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 matters a lot to how the diffusion process works. Um, and uh, the the final um, uh, to to kind of summarize that again, um, it's important to understand those those concepts. Uh, for for the, the the product itself, uh, the, the the digital realm has had major effects uh, in five different ways, really, on how products are are, are marketed on the marketing uh, on those marketing variables. So when we are considering our strategies, we want to we want to think very carefully about how the the internet will affect the product or service that we work with uh, in these concepts: core product, uh, the extension of the product line. What can online research do for us as part of our strategy and execution process? And uh, uh, how can we use the digital world to speed our development process and to speed our diffusion process? Uh, we'll talk about price here as well. Um, price has also been affected very much by, uh, by the internet. Uh, first off, let's say that price controls, uh, the digital control of price is infinite, meaning that we, d we are not stuck on, on dealing with the manufacturer suggested retail price. So if I'm producing a product and I suggest a particular price for it, um, the controls over those prices can be, can be uh, uh, quickly modified. Meaning that I might release a new product and I could change the price on that product every single hour of the day online. In an, in an earlier world, uh, in a world without the digital format that we're talking about here for marketing, uh, changing price was a, was a substantial endeavor. Uh, you're talking about changing catalogs, uh, changing stickers in stores. Uh, it, was a, it was a major process. So pricing uh, at, at the front end of, of the distribution game was very important. Uh, now price can be a, an element that I use as a research variable if I want. It's something that I can change on a regular basis to see how, how it, affects, uh, uh, it affects the uh, purchasing process. That goes into pricing strategy. Um, the, the digital world makes transparency of price an issue, meaning that uh, people can find multiple prices for products in multiple places online. Um, I was recently looking for a briefcase, and I could find the same briefcase for, for 15 different prices. If you consider that, when I go to online to look at those prices, it's not hard for me to find those those different those different prices, and what that means is that um, when I'm considering pricing a product, the target that I'm working for, meaning am I going for um, a student in high school versus a, a businessman when I'm talking about a, a laptop bag, will I uh, will I be pricing those products differently to those different audiences? Um, this was a very common practice uh, before the internet. Um, and it might be something that you need to consider as part of your pricing strategies. How widely available will those will that will those differences in prices be? Um, is is somebody going to find a price that's different in the U.S. versus in a global market? Um, those those issues all factor into my strategy, and I need to consider how I'm going to work with them. Um, there's a concept called price elasticity of demand. Uh, this is part of um, understanding our pricing strategy. What this means, uh, and this this is you know, this is a challenging concept, so, so bear with me. On price elasticity of demand, it deals with um, how changes in price impact demand of the product. Meaning that if, as price goes up or down, how strong an impact is there to demand going up or down as well? So we would say that if price changes and it highly impacts demand, meaning that if I lower my price and demand goes way up, or if I raise my price and demand goes way down, I would call my price elastic. 
if I make modifications to my price and see very little movement in, in uh, the demand for it. I raise my price, not much happens to um, how many people purchase it. I lower my price, purchases stay about the same. I would call the price inelastic. Uh, one of the issues of that is that um, uh, price is, not, is only one of the variables that people are using online uh, to make a purchase. Uh, so it may not be the primary variable, even though Steve earlier mentioned uh, the importance of price to him, it may not be the only variable that they are using to make that decision. Uh, it may be the distribution channel, so I may trust the seller of that particular product more than I trust another seller. Uh, the, obviously the brand name of the product has an impact on price, but those sort of things are, are, are only one factor in my decision making process. Uh, another area uh, of importance is um, the concept of satisficing behavior, meaning that um, this is a psychological concept about how people go about uh, satisfying themselves that they are about to make a rational decision. What's interesting is that you would think that the internet would give people the ability to make more rational decisions. I can look at a wider variety, have greater transparency of price. I can see the differential in pricing in multiple places. I have the ability to research and consider where I'm going to make my purchase very carefully. Uh, but it seems to be the case that uh, people are not necessarily as interested in researching uh, this, this variety, meaning that uh, people are influenced by uh, often the first, uh, first few sites that pull up for a product which is one of the reasons why uh, companies like Google are so important to the online world. Uh, ranking yourself in a Google search uh, has a very important impact on your selling capabilities. Being on the first page is an important concept because people are not sifting through 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 different web pages for a single purchase. Uh, this certainly does change based on how much the purchase is worth to them, what they value it at. If I'm shopping for a house versus a, a handbag, uh, how much research I do will vary. But the satisficing behavior, how deeply I research a concept, seems to be fairly narrow uh, right now on the internet. So those things uh, all affect uh, the internet pricing uh, concepts to be less uh, elastic uh, than you would think they would be. Um, it's not as not as impacting uh, an issue for people. So. Price as a factor in, in the marketing mix is important, uh, but uh, it's only one of these four variables. Uh, place is also uh, an important uh, concept. Again, if we go back into the 1960s when this concept was first uh, developed, um, we understand that distribution of my product is, is important. Uh, from a, a store location, where can I go to buy this product, and how can I, uh, how can I find it? Uh, so uh, at, at the time, I'd be seeking the widest dis distribution pro possible. Um, current examples might be uh, getting my product into Walmart. If it's if Walmart has the right target audience, uh, it has mass distribution. Uh, there's no there's no doubt about. It. So uh, place is a very important opportunity because not only do we're not, not only are there Walmart, Walmart stores all over the world, uh, there's Walmart stores all over my city. There's Walmart Mart stores, in some cases, all over my neighborhood. Um, so in that case, distribution in terms of place uh, is, is a major element for uh, the, the initial concept of the four Ps. This changes uh, with the digital world. Um, place becomes less determinate. Meaning that um, I may be able to buy the same product multiple places. It doesn't matter uh, where those places are located physically. Um, I can see all of them online at once. If I've done an effective communications uh, job, that I'm going to have better distribution. So what I'm seeking for in terms of place is to seek the most efficient points of sale I can. Uh, so rather than seeking to get into the, the largest number of locations, my consideration for place in the digital world is about making myself available in the most efficient places to make a purchase. Um, Aubrey, but you need to pay in order to be exposed in Google. Is it right? Um, that's not true. Uh, 
to be specific about Google here for a moment, um, Google really has two primary ways that you're going to get noticed. Um, you know, you've got your main search. So when I first go to Google and I type in uh, laptop bag in Google, um, 75 or 80 percent of the page that I see is going to be what they call organic rankings, meaning that um, of all the times that people have typed in laptop bag, the results that I see in 80% in of that page, the, things that, the thing is right dead center in front of me when I do my Google search, um, those are going to be organic in nature, meaning that people have uh, created websites, made purchases related to that term laptop bag, and they've developed these sites in an organic manner, meaning that people, um, people all agree that this particular website is the best for laptop bags because people vote with their with their clicks. The pay concept um, that we want to talk about is is important because um, hold on one moment for me. The pay concept is important um, understanding that that the 20 percent of the page that's on the right side of the screen um, often referred to as sponsored ads, that's where people are paying to be part of the ranking, meaning that they are targeting that keyword laptop bag. And rather than trying to get into the 80% of the page, the, the, the center of the page, the organic part of the page, um, they are bidding to be a part of that, of that side page. Um, this is certainly an element of, of place in terms of online efficiency. So it's important to consider um, is it efficient for me to actually be paying to be on that side of that Google search? Or is it more efficient for me in my communications mix, my promotion mix, uh, to focus on getting into that organic section? Um, you know, a great example, and, and you know, not to toot my own horn too much about this, but this course on Edufire, um, if you do a digital marketing search right now and uh, on Google, You'll find that, that our course in only a couple of weeks has a shot to the top of the Google rankings. Meaning that we're, we're in the number one spot, I think we're in the number two spot, and then we've also got uh, two other spots in the top ten. Meaning that anybody looking for digital marketing is going to recognize that the course that you're in and that you're studying from right now um, is one of the best digital marketing options out there when you type it into Google. Um, so that's important. We're not, we're not paying to, to be in front of people in that format. Um, information about this course is what gets that, gets that place in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the search position. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Albert. That's a great question. It's, it's absolutely great. Uh, you could spend uh, days and days talking about Google's, uh, 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 Google's format in terms of uh, the four P's and what you can do to, to maximize Google as part of that. Um, but very, very good question. Let's talk about promotion, the fourth of the four P's. Promotion really is, is probably what most people really think of when they think of marketing. It's the actual activity of communicating messages um, about your product, about your company, um, through these different channels. So, um, from a digital perspective, again, digital being a part of a multi-channel approach. Um, how you weight that approach is, is important when you're, when you're developing your strategy. But from a digital approach, I think the, the clearest perspective that you can gain on um, actually being part of um, uh, the communication mix is your, is your, your base website. Um, what, what are you using to communicate to people um, about yourself as a company? You, you need to have that up there if you're going to play in the digital world. Now, there's going to be extended positions, meaning the, the different uh, distribution channels that might be. If I'm selling laptop bags, I may be selling my product to three, four, five, six different websites that are going to try to sell my bag for me. But my base website is important as well because that's a place that people are going to go for research and information to understand more about the, the company that made the product. Um, the extended positions are, are branches out from that base position. And then I also qualify this into communications at large, which is, um, as an example, the, the social media world. Um, 
Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all of those different channels that are, have the ability to offer some sort of information about your product. Um, those are promotion elements that need to be factored into the mix. Uh, and I call that communications at large. Um, so when you're considering that, um, you want to consider where each of these parts of the whole uh, tie in to one another. So how does your base, how does your base website feed out to extended positions? How do those extended positions tie back to the base website? Communications at large. If I do a YouTube video, how is that going to come back to me at my base website and send people out to my uh, distribution channels to make a purchase? Um, important digital elements uh, for the process. Each of these being interconnected uh, really rely on, on developing a, a central foundation uh, to the promotion process. Well, I think we did it. I think we made it through everything here. We got through those two lectures. There was a lot of uh, challenge in, um, in this process, and uh, I appreciate you sticking with me through it all. Um, so uh, just as a reminder, uh, we want to go ahead and uh, uh, focus on the four Ps and think about how those uh, four Ps are, are conveyed into the digital world. Um, I specifically want us to think about the ideas of velocity um, the speed at which the digital world uh, allows us to move, and the fact that from a promotional concept, um, we've got the ability to have a, a major element of dialogue, which is different from the, the, the push communication strategies that were uh, prevalent when the four Ps were created. Uh, this dialogue uh, relates to online research. It relates to our promotion mix. Um, it's a great opportunity for us to relate with our customers more uh, quickly and efficiently and certainly adds to our uh, increase in velocity. So uh, next week, uh, same, uh, same time uh, next Thursday, we're going to be talking about approaches for uh, B2C e-commerce transactions. That's business to consumer. Uh, so that's selling your goods online, uh, leveraging B2B model presence. So. If you've got a business that is focused on selling to other businesses, how are you going to establish your presence in the, in the digital world? And we'll be talking about performance metrics. So uh, before I close out with everybody, let me go ahead and make a general question to everyone. Uh, were there any questions or comments? Uh, we covered a lot of material tonight uh, through a lot of distractions. So um, feel free, um, please let me know right now um, what questions do you have? Uh, can I go back and touch on anything for you uh, real quick? No questions, okay. Well, as a reminder, um, in the lower, lower right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see uh, uh, the file share pod. Um, and uh, we've got both uh, notes for the lectures four, which was which is the one we missed last week, and we started with this week, and lecture five. Um, they are separate. Uh, in the in the presentation you saw, uh, I combined them into a single presentation, but this allows you to keep them separate so you can organize them for your own own use. Um, make sure to pick those up. Number four, uh, lecture four is already in the content area of Edufire, so uh, just go in there and type in. Digital Marketing Lecture 4, and you should find that. Um, it's also available if you go to SlideShare. You should be able to find it there. And Lecture 5, I'll be posting here uh, sometime as soon as possible. I will send you all a link to uh, find that and um, uh, pick that up uh, for your own use. So thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate you bearing with me during, the, during that, that challenging uh, uh, spot in our technology this evening. We got through it. And, uh, I hope you all have a great evening, and I look forward to seeing you uh, next week. So take care.